all for this uh, exciting discussion. Um, Dr. Kayumi, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Kayumi from Kabul and Mr. Manish Tiwari from uh, Delhi. Um, Mr. Manish Tiwari has a distinguished fellow affiliation. Dr. Kayumi does not have one, but is regarded as a distinguished fellow of the Atlantic Council uh, because our relationship with him has run very uh, strong and deep, and we've enjoyed working with you. I'm also particularly grateful to Ambassador Mohib, who wanted to spend a good part of his time interacting with the crowd. And as he told me, his job is here to win friends for his country. And, and I can tell you that um, you're brilliant at what you do. So we've really enjoyed. You're a truly a good friend of the council. We've enjoyed working with you. And we appreciate the deep commitment that you have demonstrated towards us. And please be assured from my leadership that we are the same for your country. Um, the topic of the discussion today is I'm going to leave it to the experts to uh, kickstart the discussion. Um, and, I am, um, and I'm sure it will be a very enriching discussion. And I would like you all to stay through the end of the discussion. It's a long, rainy day. But the incentive is samosas, beers, and pakoras wow. as part of our annual reception right behind. So I know these guys will sing for their supper, but I also want you guys to sing for yours. Without further ado, Dr. Kayumi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Bharat, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure to come to DC, and specifically to Atlantic Council. It's usually the highlight of it. And for to apologize for my, I've uh, I've had the cold for over you know six weeks, and somehow I cannot get rid of it. So I thought in the past one of the reasons for taking uh, the uh, the, the flu shot is to help you, but I don't think these, these even flu shots are becoming as useful as they used to be. Well, the topic of the discussion today is assessing progress and prospects for regional connectivity in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, Central Asia, South Asia area. Uh, President Ghani, when he took over office about three years ago, uh, the whole aspect of uh, regional connectivity was something that was very high on his agenda. And uh, one of uh, the first things he did in the first year of the office, he visited all of the six countries uh, uh, that uh, border Afghanistan. And uh, uh, also internally, uh, create, uh, there was one council that was created for uh, regional connectivity with the idea of how you know, to reimagine the role that Afghanistan played back in the, you know, in the before uh, the 19th century as part of the uh, Silk Road and before uh, maritime uh, merchant uh, routes really became big. And to see how Afghanistan could really that play that role both as part of uh, in the 21st century model, uh, both uh, for the North-South, for Central Asians, uh, connections to the warm waters, as well as the East-West uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, some of the other things that also created, you know, uh, really a part of the discussion and dynamics was the China's Belt and Road uh, Initiative as well as uh, the Central Asian countries uh, looking south as well. So basically the, uh, the motto that we took, the tagline was that Afghanistan wants to be, uh, you know, get back its role which was the, uh, the roundabout of the region and seeing how Afghanistan can really uh, capitalize on its uh, geographic dividends in, in serving that purpose. And as part of it, you know, we try to look at all of the aspects in three key areas in terms of movement of goods, movement of energy, and movement of data. So one of the other aspects in terms of uh, uh, improving and enhancing opportunities for trades uh, was Afghanistan ascension to the becoming part of the World Trade Organization, and uh, also a number of uh, regional uh, projects that had been there uh, tried to uh, give a lot of, uh, in, give a lot of uh, uh, momentum to those projects. Uh, uh, I'll just mention a few of them. The, uh, in terms of energy, it was the CASA 1000 project. This is an electrical uh, project that was uh, taking electricity from uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, the Afghanistan to Pakistan. That, uh, that project has been well underway. Afghanistan has been the first country that actually signed the uh, design and construction of that project about six months ago. And uh, uh, it's well on the project and it's moving forward. Uh, that project will move about 1,300 
megawatts of electricity from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to Afghanistan. About 300 will be used in Afghanistan. About 1,000 plus will be used in Pakistan. Uh, the second one uh, was uh, uh, you know, the TAPI or the uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline that has been in discussion for uh, more than two decades. Uh, I'm glad to report that you know, actually last on the 24th of uh, this month, uh, we celebrated uh, seeing that pipeline getting to Afghanistan border, uh, uh, Afghanistan border and, uh, to, uh, uh, and also now the work is going to start both from the city of Herat in the western part of Afghanistan and the uh, Turkmen border. So within a two-year period, that pipeline will be in the uh, city of Herat and will be able to use uh, gas from that pipeline. And the plan is in that kind of a stage way, move it down to Farah, uh, Nimroz, Kandahar, uh, eventually to Pakistan and India. Another project along that line was also the uh, TAP, which is uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, high voltage transmission line, which initially will move about 2,000 megawatts of power from uh, Turkmenistan to uh, Pakistan via Afghanistan on the western side, as well as uh, uh, eventually moving that to 4,000 megawatts of power. And that, uh, you know, the initial agreement was signed uh, over two years ago, and then <coughs> on the 24th, the, three, uh, the countries uh, signed the elements for that one, so we can, so we can actually go ahead and do the, begin the rate negotiations, and then the construction, and the sign of that project. And, and, uh, as a matter of fact, there is a Turkish company who has already shown willingness to, uh, to finance that project. Within the country, the, Afghanistan has been building its uh, uh, electrical national grid, which we never had a grid before, basically. Our power-wise, we had been uh, supplied by uh, nine different power islands. And this uh, power grid with a backbone of 500 kV would not only help us move power in a major area within the country, but also be able to move power from uh, Central Asia to, uh, to Pakistan and uh, beyond. Uh, so the hope is that despite the fact that we currently uh, uh, import over 80% of our electricity within a five year period, we can move from a, uh, from a country that is importing electricity to becoming a country that will be primarily uh, a uh, uh, a country that will be a transit for electricity. And as part of it, how we can really utilize about 23,000 megawatts of uh, hydro power that we have, about 70,000 megawatts of uh, wind and uh, 220,000 megawatts of uh, solar to see how much of that could be economically uh, possible and work on that one. What I'm really pleased to report is in the last uh, few weeks, we finished uh, four, uh, four of the projects that has gone through the uh, procurement. Uh, these are uh, public-private partnerships where over half a billion dollars have been invested by private sector on a, one on a solar project, uh, two natural gas uh, gen power generation, and one hydroelectric generation. And right now we have about 16 other major projects along that area. Uh, which will, uh, you know, uh, which uh, constitutes of about uh, s uh, five hydropower projects, but three coal-fired projects, some solar and wind. For the first time, we're going to begin to use our coal reserves to be uh, to be used for uh, power generation, and in a country that has very high-quality coal, over about a billion ton of that one, uh, about 700 kilometers in length from uh, borders to uh, China all the way to Iran. We see tremendous possibility, especially working with U.S. companies because that quality of coal that we have is high in, uh, it's bright by two minutes to anthracite quality, high BTU content, low ash, low sulfur, which is very similar to the coal seams of uh, West Virginia and Kentucky, and we see uh, potential opportunities along that area. The second aspect has been the movement of goods. And uh, we have been working on, you know, first of all, our, uh, uh, our uh, uh, railway grid and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, infrastructure uh, and master plan for that one. 
the highest priority that we have is on the our northern route, which will be connecting uh, Uzbekistan to uh, Iran. Uh, for that one, not only Afghanistan has deep interest, but Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan are very much interested, so they can really find a good movement to those uh, to Iran and beyond to Europe. They find that route, these routes, to give them alternate routes, so everything does not have to be through Russia. But also, this will be the beginning of uh, uh, the extension of that route going south to, our, uh, uh, to all the way to the port of Charbahar, which will still be the closest warm port for all of the Central Asian countries. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, and uh, India signed uh, an agreement about a year and a half ago for the port of Charbahar. And we really see that to be a major, uh, a major uh, benefit for us. Uh, also, uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, Afghanistan is part of the Five Nation Railroad Project, which involves uh, China, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Iran. Uh, so this piece that I talked about from Uzbekistan border to, to, uh, to, uh, Iran, uh, to Iran is going to be about 80% of that project, so we need, we'll need that, that piece uh, to be built as well. Uh, in addition to that, we've had, uh, in the last two years, we've seen the uh, connectivity, railroad connectivity with uh, our neighboring country, Turkmenistan, uh, on the uh, Akina area, where through which it connects Afghanistan to uh, Turkmenistan, uh, through the Caspian to, uh, to Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey as part of the Lapis Lazuli uh, <coughs> route. Uh, as well as uh, uh, through Turkundi, which is uh, north-south from on the western part of the country. So uh, I think from all of these aspects, it shows that. And also, we've had discussions with Pakistan on the CPAC, with Pakistan and China on the CPAC, and see what we have connectivity with them. And uh, those discussions are early, and if there are any connection, uh, questions, I'll be glad to respond to them. And lastly, on that aspect, it was the very historic trip that President Ghani had to Uzbekistan last December, where 14 major agreements and uh, memorandums of agreements were signed. Uh, and some of the major ones was uh, this railroad project that I talked about, a 500 kV transmission lines from, uh, from uh, uh, Uzbekistan to Afghanistan, and that trade and transit route, which really means that now our goods can go to, uh, from Afghanistan via Uzbekistan to Kazakhstan, <coughs> Russia, and China quite easily. And also they offered uh, the Andijan port, dry port, which means that basically through that we could truck uh, a lot of our goods to Andijan, and then, to ch and then it can be on the railroad from that point. So the route right now, when we, we get two trains from China to Afghanistan, uh, and now it, the, uh, the process takes about a month or so for goods to, from Afghanistan to China. And now, with, through the Andijan route, it will be uh, that will be dropped to less uh, to three days or so. So I think that it, it is going to be quite important for us also. In addition, we have been uh, working and uh, creating our air corridors. Last year was the first year that for our fresh routes we started an air uh, corridor with uh, India, uh, Delhi. That has been very successful. We're looking at the possibility of expanding that to Bombay as well this coming year. And also looking at expanding of that to United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, even Malaysia and Indonesia have shown uh, quite a bit of interest as well. So we see uh, that in terms of moving of goods, we have made uh, quite a bit of progress. And uh, our hope is that with, through these, uh, as we built more of the railroad, in terms of moving our mines and the development of mines, that will become much easier as well. And lastly, I think that we don't want to forget about the data piece. Uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, we passed the legislations to uh, to make uh, uh, to break the go government's monopoly on uh, owning the fiber and leasing and controlling the fiber. So now, any entity, foreign or domestic, can invest in the uh, fiber optics, can own fiber optics, and lease it both for uh, their own use as well as. Uh, uh, transit data to and through Afghanistan, 
And as part of it, we were able to sign a memorandum of agreement with China uh, through the Wakhan Corridor, which connects Kashgar through our city of uh, Faisalabad in the Badakhshan area. And eventually that could become part of a corridor that connects China. Actually, the communication time from uh, China to Iran could drop to a third of the time right now. And eventually that could be the shortest route in connection of India to, uh, to Caucasus. Uh, the Gulf and all, uh, eventually to even uh, to Africa. I know that chi China has been looking at the Gwadar uh, CPEC route to be the main one for data to, uh, to Africa, but actually the one that I talked about is a little bit shorter, but certainly when you talk about that volume of traffic, having alternate routes would really be the possibilities in ways. So I think uh, in terms of connectivity in the past two years, there has been quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, movement and actually projects that are happening and um, uh, and we see that to be the beginning of uh, these opportunities and lastly I think it's the first time again after 100 years that Central Asian countries look at Afghanistan as part of Central Asia as part of that entity and uh, you know countries that we have been uh, you know dealing with and trading for several millennia or you know we're becoming part of that economic ecosystem but also our relationship with South Asia could really be, you know, could be strengthened because, because we can be that, uh, the, the connecting element of Central Asia to South Asia. So with that, why don't I stop here and then we'll continue on with the questions. That's a great, great segue because um, the connection, obviously, um, you can pick up where it connects. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it connects. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Bharat, uh, for inviting me back to the Atlantic Council. Uh, Mr. Kayumi, ladies and gentlemen, it's always uh, good to assess the prospects of regional connectivity uh, in our part of the world. And uh, as uh, Dr. Kayumi was speaking, uh, my thoughts really went back to 1985 when the entire raison d'etre of the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, when it was brought into existence, was actually to see uh, as to whether uh, economic interdependence, economic linkages uh, could really triumph uh, and surmount the politics of the region and uh, create a common South Asian community because it's a non sequitur to say that uh, given the kind of challenges which are there in South Asia in terms <laughs> of human development indices, whether it is poverty, malnutrition, uh, challenges of illiteracy, uh, these all can be mitigated to a very, very great extent. If there is connectivity uh, from Myanmar all the way to Afghanistan, and uh, vice versa. And that was, in fact, a big part of the founding vision of the uh, South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, that eventually we would be able to uh, try and uh, work around the politics of the region and really bring about uh, economic uh, interdependence. The feeling was that uh, if we were to succeed in this endeavor, you know, eventually some of the long festering political disputes uh, which have bedeviled uh, our part of the world would automatically possibly uh, find a way of either resolving themselves or would be sufficiently consigned to the back burner and not really be an irritant uh, in the progress of, uh, of, of South Asia. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the reality turned out to be quite different. And notwithstanding the fact that uh, at every SARC summit which has been held or has been contemplated or has been by uh, one of the uh, swan songs of all the leaders has been this uh, project of regional connectivity. Uh, various prime ministers at various points in time have uh, outlined this vision of having breakfast in New Delhi, having uh, lunch in Islamabad, and 
dinner in Kabul, but uh, or vice versa, or vice versa. <laughs> but uh, so be it, uh, and that's where we are. But last year, when uh, I heard uh, President Ashraf Ghani, um, when the Atlantic Council hosted him in New York, uh, I was really impressed by the conviction of courage that he had in trying to persevere with this vision and trying to see that notwithstanding the difficulties and the challenges which Afghanistan is facing, uh, he is uh, going ahead and trying to operationalize what he sees is uh, really the future of uh, the larger South Asian region. But in reality, as I was uh, mentioning to Dr. Kayumi earlier, what is happening is that uh, there are uh, two parallel subsets of connectivity which are developing. So there is this connectivity of Afghanistan with Central Asia, uh, which is fast becoming a reality in terms of the number of projects which uh, Dr. Kayumi outlined. Some of them are uh, beyond the stage of incubation and some of them are in the stage of implementation. And uh, on the other side, uh, you have uh, a number of connectivity projects which are developing to the east of India. So whether you have the BBIN, that is the Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal uh, road uh, network or uh, road arrangement, or you have BIMSTEC, which is the larger Bay of Bengal community, there is a number of regional connectivity initiatives which have fructified and which are in various stages uh, of evolution. But uh, it all does not come together because when it comes to the Vaga Atari border, uh, the difficulty in uh, really connecting South Asia to Central Asia with Afghanistan being the land bridge uh, does not really fructify. If I'm uh, not improperly informed, uh, possibly the very, very ambitious uh, uh, trade and transit treaty which Afghanistan negotiated with Pakistan has run its course uh, and it expired in 2015. And I think possibly some kind of an ad hoc arrangement still continues to hold the field. Uh, but insofar as the trade and transit treaty uh, between India and <coughs> Pakistan is concerned, well, uh, we have difficulties uh, even in, uh, in being given the most favored nation status uh, by Pakistan because unfortunately when it translates into the vernacular uh, it comes out as as uh, the, the, the most loved nation or something of that sort which we certainly are not in, uh, you know, in that particular part of the world. So be that as it may, uh, I think what is indeed instructive if you look at the history of the last three decades is the connectivity initiatives are still worth pursuing, notwithstanding the politics of it. And one of the greatest uh, evolutions which has taken place in these last three decades is that uh, the entire Westphalian construct of nation states is being slowly rendered redundant by the march of technology. So therefore, uh, notwithstanding the fact that nations may not talk to each other, but you have the Facebook lands, the Twitter lands, the WhatsApp lands, where connectivity absolutely is seamless, even, uh, even among countries where nations have endeavored to put up the barriers as high as possible. And so therefore, uh, in addition to physical connectivity, it is really the digital connectivity. It is the movement of goods and services over digital highways. Uh, the connectivity in terms of e-commerce, uh, the connectivity in terms of, uh, of, of uh, being able to uh, really access uh, the virtual civilization without, uh, without those barriers uh, being omnipresent, really, I think, is the future of, uh, of, of South Asian connectivity. Because uh, as I see it, uh, at least over the next... Uh, or over the short and the medium term, the politics of the region is not going to get any easier. As we speak, you have three countries which are heading into elections this very year. 
Afghanistan has its presidential election and parliamentary election. Pakistan would have an election in the month of September and India would have its elections by the end of this year or early next year. So therefore, there would be maybe a completely different political reality at the end of 2018 in all these uh, three countries uh, which uh, may eventually work better for the region or uh, may not work so well. I mean, that's really a matter of speculation. But notwithstanding that, the constant is that if, uh, if the South Asian nations were to come together and unveil an alternative vision, an alternative vision of digital connectivity, of digital highways, uh, where, which, which, which uh, complement and supplement the, the physical connectivity projects which China has very ambitiously uh, unveiled. Uh, some of them which uh, we do not have a problem with, but some of them which we definitely have a problem with in, in terms of sovereignty. But I think uh, setting that aside and letting it uh, ride on its own momentum, it is the digital piece which is uh, really going to be important. And if we are able to put the digital piece in place uh, effectively over the next uh, three or five years, I think even the elements of physical connectivity which are missing in the South Asian region would automatically as an imperative or as an impulse of uh, economics uh, may start really falling into place. So uh, uh, from, from my point of view or from our point of view, if you were to assess regional connectivity or, uh, or aspects of uh, regional connectivity, I think uh, things have not been very encouraging in terms of seamless physical connectivity over the last three and a half decades. But technology definitely offers an opening. And I think that opening should be leveraged to the best, best extent possible by uh, incentivizing private enterprise in all these uh, countries to take the initiative, to take the lead, and uh, put these, these elements in place. And I think uh, we possibly would be able to then uh, actually have a future in South Asia whereby you could travel with a single rail ticket or a single bus ticket all the way from Myanmar to Kabul. Thank you. Thank you. On that optimistic note, I want to start. I'll, I'll have a couple. I'll have a question or two for both of you, and then I'll open it to the floor. And feel free to jump in uh, whenever you can. I think, um, Dr. Kayumi, I think um, you outlined progress along a variety of areas and a variety of uh, issues. And you've been with your establishment for now almost four years? It's two and a half. Two and a half? It looks four years, but it's two yeah. and a half okay. years. <laughs> I'm sorry. But... <laughs> <laughs> but um, when you started, when you started your job, yeah. What was your ideal outcome, and where are you now, and are you happy with the progress that you have made, and what are some of the challenges that you have faced in achieve, achieving and realizing those objectives, and what would you do differently sitting today? I think the directions that we have uh, chosen, I'm happy with it. I was hoping that we would be able to make uh, more, you know, more progress or faster progress. Uh, I think you know a few of those uh, changes that has happened has really been, a, you know, our relationship with uh, uh, with Uzbekistan has, you know, had its watershed moment. I mean, if uh, I don't believe three years ago anybody could have imagined uh, that we would have such a close relationship with uh, with Uzbekistan and now I've gone. Both Afghanistan and, uh, and Uzbekistan are interested in having, in making sure that our uh, trade will be the highest uh, among any other country that we would have. Uh, I think Kazakhstan having such a close interest in Afghanistan, uh, I think uh, we would have not, uh, we would have not uh, really expected. Uh, the fact that we have made, uh, you know, uh, progress in a number of these projects, I think it's uh, it's great. We would like to see more of it. Uh, I was hoping that, you know, some of the, let's say, for the railroad projects, we would be seeing more financing opportunities. We're still working on it to get that, uh, and especially that Northern Railroad that I mentioned is something that we have quite a bit of interest. We're hoping that the 
uh, built and road initiative, the Five Nation Railroad, would uh, really uh, move from a concept uh, to reality. I think that's going to be uh, that's going to be quite uh, uh, quite important. Uh, I think you know, the, as Mr. Tawari mentioned, one of the key uh, impediment has been that Waga Atari issue between, uh, which is the border between uh, Pakistan, uh, India area, and. Um, I made one proposal and said, well, you know, because the, the view of uh, uh, Pakistanis has been that, well, you know, look at, if you just move that, uh, we, you know, you guys can have full access, look at all of the need that uh, India has and how Afghanistan can play a major role. I said, you know, absolutely. But you also look at, because India has been our traditional, uh, uh, you know, trade partner. But the other side is look at the, Capacity of Afghanistan. How much could we could really, you know, use that? Even if you want, if we wanted to send all, you know, all of our goods just to India, and as part of it, I proposed uh, uh, basically a pilot model. That how about for the a period of three months or six months, you could have a hundred trucks or fifty trucks can go through Wagha Atari uh, in a way that should be uh, without the current model, which is so slow. And then, by the same token, uh, Pakistan would have access to the Central Asian market because right now they are blocked through the Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, rather than trying to look at that closely and, and evaluate and see if there is any merit or so, their view is well, you know, uh, for Pakistan, Central Asian market is not that important. Uh, it's I recall. Not that important? No, it's not that important. This is a direct quote. Yeah. And uh, even when we had, as part of the discussion uh, uh, last July, when we in uh, Dushanbe uh, f on the discussions of the three-country uh, trade agreement uh, between Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and uh, and uh, Pakistan, uh, the Wagha Atari issue was brought up. Uh, at, uh, that time, Pr Premier Nawaz Sharif's comment was basically about the level of bloodshed and uh, and, Kash uh, and Kashmir. And of course, one of the things that Afghanistan has done, that, uh, and what we have pushed for, that despite the fact that, you know, we have the political issues with Pakistan, in terms of trade, how can we really find ways that the trade could be unimpeded? And I can say, you know, for instance, personally, I have been this, one of the strongest advocates of seeing how we can get electricity from Central Asia to Pakistan, because it's not only good for. Pakistan is good for Afghanistan, it's good for Central Asian countries. It's one way to build more interdependencies. So I think for Pakistan to, as long as they stick to that piece of, uh, uh, of Waga Atari having to do something with Kashmir in, uh, in the issue, in the political issues there, I think that becomes a non-starter. You know, we, as I alluded in my discussions earlier, we began uh, basically with China's interest to start a dialogue between Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan uh, on the uh, CPAC and seeing what are the projects that we could work on. We identified you know, five key projects and these projects were the railway connectivity through Chaman, Spinboat like to Kandahar, so eventually Pakistani go goods and Indian goods can go through that to Central Asia and back and forth. Second was uh, a railway connectivity from Baramcha to Gwadar. So we, our view was that between Gwadar and Charbahar, whichever one develops soonest and connectivity is established for Central Asia, that's the one that's going to be pre predominantly used. The third was a hydropower project uh, in uh, Kabul Konar, on, along Kabul Konar Basin, which could generate about 1,400 uh, 1, megawatts of power where 90% of it will actually be for the benefit of Pakistan as a power sale. Uh, the, you know, the, the fifth project was the railway connectivity from uh, uh, Peshawar to Kabul, and the fifth one was uh, what uh, Pakistanis were interested in, was a, a motorway from uh, Peshawar to Kabul. The only ones that Pakistanis had interest was that motorway. And we were interested in talking about that motorway, but the condition would be that we can talk about the uh, Waga Atari as part of it because we are not interested in more imports from Pakistan. We are interested in opening the route to India because India has traditionally been our major, uh, major trading partner. 
so I think this is, uh, these are some of the areas that we have not made progress. And uh, I think if, that, if we do not really see progress in this area, what I could really see a scenario where we will try to bypass the connectivity through Pakistan uh, in terms of mean, uh, moving our goods, really use the Hairatan to Uzbekistan route as well as Charbahar as our major route, and of course through Iran uh, as the major routes, and basically nothing going through Pakistan, so Pakistan could basically be uh, bypassed. I think I, at least theoretically, I see that potential scenario. Okay, thank you. I'll hold that thought, and I'll come back to both of you for that. Um, and and your question for you, the question was, um, you've you, you ended on a very optimistic note on the digital connectivity piece. And, I, and if I understand correctly, and if I read you correctly, you're, you also said it has the potential to improve the physical connectivity. Um, having physical connectivity hasn't improved between these three nations in the last 20, 20 years or so, if I want to put a timestamp on it. And in fact, one would even argue that it has deteriorated. When you have such a trend line, how are you optimistic in the current scenario when each of these governments, at least in the short run, including the administration in the United States, are distracted with their own policy priorities? How, would you, how are you so optimistic that the, that the digital connectivity has the potential to improve the physical connectivity? Look, Bharat, let me uh, give you three uh, substantive examples. At the, uh, even at the height of uh, relations between India and Pakistan being uh, less than uh, in very good shape, we have uh, barter trade between uh, <clears throat> our Kashmir and uh, the Kashmir which is occupied by them. And that barter trade agreement, even through <coughs> the worst days of uh, the relationship uh, actually plunging to another, has really held and uh, it's now been in play for close to a decade now. So therefore, uh, there is a strong case whereby uh, trade relationships have a certain imperative of their own. And so therefore, uh, notwithstanding the politics, uh, they are able to persevere and they're able to maintain a momentum of their own. The second thing is that uh, if you look at the media markets, now uh, there is a thriving market uh, for Indian media products, be it music, be it films, be it uh, various other forms of entertainment uh, in Pakistan. It all goes through the United Arab Emirates uh, or through other third countries. In fact, uh, the third country trade between India and Pakistan is actually much more than the quantum of bilateral trade it's between uh, yeah, yeah, between the two countries. In fact, uh, one Indian DTH operator alone, you know, earns uh, uh, millions of uh, rupees in revenue from Pakistan uh, through uh, the illegal proliferation of direct-to-home television. So the point that I'm trying to make is that the uh, the potential of digital connectivity uh, and physical connectivity being able to surmount political differences has been demonstrated even in the most contentious dispute in South Asia. So therefore, uh, if let's suppose you are able to get the uh, digital piece in, uh, in, in play and that digital piece is really backed by uh, robust e-commerce operators on, uh, on, on all sides of uh, the South Asian uh, uh, common market. You know, for example, you know, Bangladesh has been producing uh, goods now or textiles at very, very competitive prices. And uh, if, let's suppose, uh, e-commerce can be leveraged in order to sell them uh, in the larger South Asian market, that's uh, that's that that would be a huge plus. That is, you know, just just one example which I am. And once that starts happening, then that creates a pressure in the physical markets also, because people realize that they are missing out on an opportunity. They are missing out on on a business potential, and then uh, they start, you know, driving policy or at least attempting to drive policy, 
They may succeed, they may not succeed, but that momentum at least gets created. At the moment, there is an absence of momentum in the larger South Asian region from the business community to actually try and create a common market. In, in all the, or everybody has accepted that status quo is a fait accompli and status quo is what they have to live with. Um, on that optimistic note, I just wanted to draw a parallel for on the security side of things. I think India and Pakistan have a missile testing notification agreement, ballistic missile testing notification agreement, which I think each side agrees to notify the other um, 72 hours ahead of a ballistic missile test. And I think that's a provision also in the Hague Code of Conduct. And both are not parties to the Hague Code of Conduct. But despite the worst case scenarios and the deterioration in relationships at times, this agreement, if, I'm, if I understand correctly, and you know, I'm not privy to classified information, but I believe this agreement still holds watertight. And this agreement is honored by both sides because they respect both individuals' nuclear capacity. So there is, there is some optimism to draw from, from that story. Um, but I wanted to come back to both of you. Um, you mentioned the point about bypassing Pakistan. Yeah. Okay. Um, and through the Chabahar port or you know the other various options. Um, there are two. The, I I want you both to drill on this because I think India is an equal uh, participant in the Chabahar port and has incentives to continue its trade and transit routes through Chabahar. Also connect this to the larger. I, I would like you. I would like you both to connect this to the larger U.S. regional, so-called regional strategy that the administration announced a good few months ago. Um, and you, you, you obviously are very well aware of the United States' relationship with Iran in the present climate under this administration. So there are obviously some challenges there. So what are some of the things that you can, you can, in terms of prospects of realizing this? Um, uh, bypassing Pakistan. How realistic are you from, from, from wherever you are sitting? Well, I think, uh, you know, between, when we look at Charbahar Gwada, it's not only Pakistan-Iran issue, but it's basically the China-India relationship that, or the rivalry or whatever that we need to look at it as. You know, we have to look at it within that context as well. I think one of the other reasons that we're interested in looking beyond you know, uh, our goods and uh, moving to pa Pakistan is practically whatever we, you know, the way it, the goods go to Pakistan is in a very, very traditional way, not much in terms of quality control, in terms of standardization, in terms of packaging and all of that. It's exactly the same way that we used to do that when Alexander invaded Afghanistan. Of course, there was no Pakistan at that time, but in terms of moving of that same kind of goods, it's the same way with big sacks or whatever, without much quality control, without much uh, packaging, without much. So I think for us, moving, looking at other markets, you know, if you're trying to sell to Russia, if you're trying to sell to, uh, to the Gulf areas, they are not, you know, they have strong, uh, you know, purchasing power. They expect certain levels of quality. They expect particular types of packaging and all of that. So in a way, it forces us to to come, you know, to bring our uh, our uh, product, uh, you know, product standards and quality control and all of that to the part that is expected internationally or at least within the region. So I think that's one of the aspects that I see this move to be uh, quite important and helpful. Uh, secondly, I think if we are starting moving our goods through, you know, uh, uh, let's say through Charba, uh, through Charbahar, it, you know, in order to make the mar uh, in order to make that kind of a transaction more economical, it means that of course uh, the uh, all of the ships have to be full on both sides, which means that a lot of the goods that comes to Afghanistan from Pakistan does not have to come from Afghanistan. Now it can come from India. So the, those are the two aspects that you know can really reduce the volume of trade between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, which right now it's over two billion, could be dropped to you know to hopefully a hundred million or less. Now uh, I'm not trying to uh, you know underemphasize the, the 
you know, the challenges, the, the role in all of that, but I think that kind of a scenario is quite possible. I do understand the, the complications of the relationship between the U.S. and, uh, and uh, Iran. I think one of the tests of that would really be seen uh, relatively soon as the discussions will come on the nuclear uh, agreements. And I think that would really be a, a first uh, bird's eye of see what will be the prospects in the long run between the Iran, uh, or at least in the medium range, uh, between Iran and, uh, and the U.S. <clears throat> I, I think perhaps one thing which needs to be very clearly understood is that Chabar is a commercial enterprise. The Chabar port is a commercial enterprise. The Gwadar port is a strategic military enterprise. There is a distinction between uh, as to why uh, those two projects have been conceived. Similarly, the China-Pakistan economic corridor is not a connectivity project. It is a strategic project. It's a strategic project where by, by which China seeks uh, access to the Arabian Sea. Uh, China also seeks to surmount the Malacca dilemma uh, through uh, water and uh, the entire uh, CPEC paradigm. So therefore, you are actually trying to compare apples and pears when you really compare Gwadar, uh, Kwe, Chabar. These are two different uh, uh, elements altogether. And if you couple that with the kind of things which the Chinese have been attempting to do in the Indian Ocean, the influence that they've been trying to exert on Sri Lanka, the, the developments which are currently playing themselves out in the <coughs> leaves, uh, it does not augur well for the region. And therefore, for the United States will have to make some hard choices. And the hard choice is that is a short-term accommodation with Iran. Uh, the cost of a long-term, uh, I would not use the word containment, but a long-term strategy Kuwait China. And I think those are the hard conversations which the United States needs to start having with itself. Because if it does see you know, China as a long-term, I would not say threat, but as a long-term rival, you know, given the kind of stuff which is happening or has been happening in the South China Sea over a period of time, uh, you, all, you find elements of that you know, now being almost replayed uh, in, in the Indian Ocean. You know, the time has come when, when, when you know, a lot of this cannot be swept under the carpet. And therefore, uh, at some point in time, uh, hard decisions and clear choices will need to be made. It's all a tweet away. So, yeah. <laughs> I want to turn uh, the gentleman there. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Amal Khan. I'm a Could visiting you? fellow in Atlantic House, uh, South Asia Center. I'm audible. I have a question uh, to both the gentlemen that uh, in India-Pakistan trade relation there are 1200 items which are highly tariffed between the two countries. So the question is that if Afghanistan able to get into the Indian market, it would be the same treatment with Pakistan or it would be another type of uh, relationship beyond Pakistan-India relation? Thank you. I'll take one more question before I come. Uh I'll come this side. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kaimi, good to see you again. It's been a while, and I want to congratulate you on all the progress you've been making with the open access policy and with the fiber uh, capabilities, which will present opportunities for better uh, cross-border connectivity in various locations. On that topic of uh, cross-border connectivity, uh, reaching to submarine cable systems, of course, the way in which that occurs is through cable landing stations at ports such as Qadar, Chabahar, etc. And so I have two questions. One is, uh, while we have seen some stimulation for uh, establishing a cable landing station at Qadar through a submarine cable system running from the uh, Persian Gulf uh, eastwards towards India, uh, which uh, may or not, may not progress at this immediate juncture in terms of putting out a bridge to uh, 
establish an active cable landing system, at least that has stimulated the activity for a cable landing station to be developed at Qatar. What I have seen so far, and I may be a little bit behind on it, is uh, through the phase development activity for Chabahar, I'm not aware of any explicit statements yet about the development of a cable landing station at Chabahar, and was wondering if you might be able to shed some light on that. And then the second question, um, so very quickly, very quickly is has to do with the peace cable system in the region, which uh, is uh, the system administrator being Huawei. And my understanding about that system is it's primarily going to uh, landing stations in Africa, not at this juncture uh, having to label uh, cable landing station at Qatar, bringing it up into South Central Asia, wondering if there is an update from either of you with regards to the prospects for that peace cable system to also include connectivity to the Qatar port. Thank you. Thank you. Want to, want to Which one to take? Ours. Okay, I'll try. Well, first of all, I think that in terms of uh, the movement of goods between Afghanistan and to India right now, uh, the relationship is that, is, uh, of course, Afghanistan has the most favored uh, nation relationship with, uh, uh, with India. So I, I think most of the products that from Afghanistan has the minimum or no uh, tariff duty, uh, for instance. Uh, so I believe that uh, same thing continues, whether that goes through uh, Charbahar or whether that goes through Wagatari, I don't believe that will be any difference. And uh, maybe uh, Tawari may have more information on that one. In terms of that, too, uh, uh, on the cable question, uh, first of all, uh, you know, the prospect of uh, that I see there is now as Central Asian countries are more also interested in, in looking south, uh, the possibility of having a landing a cable landing station becomes even higher and our hope is that maybe with uh, you know some kind of combination of Afghanistan Kazakhstan uh, Uzbekistan we could you know the traffic would be such that we could build that one and make it economical uh, at this point of course as you as you may know traditionally we have been taking most of our cable uh, data connectivity through Pakistan and some from Iran we are moving the, uh, most of that one through Central Asian countries and uh, even possibly with it through China as we get the the, uh, the Wuhan corridor built, but we you know definitely see the potential of uh, of a station, especially when we talk about several countries, because again Central Asian countries right now being totally dependent on the Trans Siberian uh, fiber, they are trying to look at <coughs> looking at, L, uh, at other possibilities and certainly connecting through the. Charbahar would be uh, would be a, a very viable choice, especially when you look at a combination of uh, Central Asian countries combined, looking at that opportunity plus Afghanistan. I think uh, in terms of the second question on the peace cable, at this point, I don't really have any specific information. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, just to your point, uh, tariffs are uh, country specific, so therefore uh, mode of transit doesn't really uh, change the nature of tariffs. So therefore, whether it comes by land or it comes by sea, you know, the, uh, the, the origin of goods is what decides uh, uh, the, the, the tariffs at which uh, they are charged. So I don't think they'll substantively change everything. My apologies, but I'm not really updated on, uh, on the finer aspects of, uh, of submarine uh, landing systems. <laughs> Uh, here. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an intel analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, given that uh, the, the number one impediment to investment in Afghanistan is uh, terrorism, um, do, can any of you shed light on the degree of sort of intelligence cooperation between Afghanistan and its northern neighbors? And perhaps more importantly, is that a direct discussion or is that mediated through a third party like the US or Russia or India or Pakistan? I work for a think tank, so I don't have any intel. 
briefings. So, but I'll leave it to the officials and former uh, officials. I was well, you heard uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, of course, uh, working on the development side, I don't have any direct information. But what I know that uh, in the past uh, two years or so, there has been a lot of direct um, meetings, and actually now on a periodic basis between Afghanistan. Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan with our security teams meeting and discussing a lot of bilateral issues and also in terms of exchange uh, and, and uh, uh, releasing of a lot of the terrorists from those countries that, we have, that uh, were captured in Afghanistan, they, ha they had been turned over in the shortest period of time. So I think from that point of view, that aspect of the relationship with Central Asian countries have come a long way and uh, the cooperation uh, with, all, uh, with Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, as well as uh, uh, Kazakhstan is very close. With Kyrgyzstan, we don't have that much, uh, you know, that much interactions because there's not much. You know, we don't have any common borders or so. But uh, yeah, that relationship has really come, on, come a long way, and there is close bilateral cooperation. Yeah. Okay. Gentleman here. Aguvir Goel, I'm with the India Globe in Asia today. I'm a journalist in Washington. My question is this I've been asking for the last 30 years. People of Afghanistan are still suffering and waiting when they will see peace and stability and in their life in their country. My question is many nations are involved solving this problem in Afghanistan. But my question is is Pakistan fully involved? in solving the problem in Afghanistan as far as terrorism is concerned for peace and stability? Or can you have peace in your country without the fully involvement of Pakistan? And finally, what role do you think you want India to play in the future? Thank you. I think, uh, you it's know, It's a very easy uh, question. Yeah, it's a very easy <laughs> question. Uh, we've had the same question before also. <laughs> Well, you know, Afghanistan and India has a, a histor you know, long historic relationship that, you know, that spans several millennia. Uh, so that relationship has existed and exists, and uh, hopefully it will exist in the future. I think the, you know, the way that I would like to rephrase the question is that to what extent, you know, whether it's Pakistan or some of the other countries, they look at the stability of Afghanistan to be there to their advantage. You know, certainly our belief is that uh, if any country in the region is not stable, it will affect all of those countries negatively. Despite the fact that in a narrow sense, some of the countries will feel that, uh, let's see, the misery of another country could be a blessing for them. Because in the long term, it will be misery for all of those countries. So I, uh, at least my personal belief is that uh, I hope eventually we see the day that Pakistan will see the light that a stable Afghanistan could be far more beneficial to Pakistan than an unstable Afghanistan. Well, uh, as you're aware that India has always been committed to uh, a peaceful, stable, and a prosperous Afghanistan. That goes without saying. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, is that the shared vision of some of the countries which uh, do border Afghanistan? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Because uh, there are some people or there are some nations which uh, see an incentive in peace. And uh, there are others, for uh, very domestic reasons, who actually see an incentive in conflict. And unfortunately, uh, Afghanistan, uh, for all the wrong reasons, has uh, been uh, uh, at the receiving end because uh, one of its neighbors actually perceives that they have uh, a greater interest uh, in instability rather than stability. Um, have you? <clears throat> thank you, Bharat, and thank you for having a conversation on Afghanistan I'm, that revolves by the on... Way, please introduce yourself. I will. My name is Arya. <laughs> After you me. have. My name is Arya Nijad. I'm a fellow with Atlantic Council. And she's one of our Millennium Leadership Fellows, and we're mm -hmm. very proud to have her. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having a conversation on Afghanistan that revolves around economic discussions as opposed to something that we always see, which is politics. My question is uh, for Dr. Seb Qayoumi. Bada salam. Uh, 
is the volume of trade uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, particularly export from Afghanistan to Pakistan, the same as the volume of uh, the goods that would be sent from Afghanistan to India via the air corridor. And the reason why I'm asking that is because if it's not the same, is there um, a mechanism assessed or discussed or being thought about that would ensure that farmers will not be affected if that volume drops, particularly with regards to fresh fruits and vegetables? Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, for, for some of that issue, we do not, uh, the, with Pakistan, since we have so, uh, so much of the trade that is, uh, you know, that is uh, legit and so much of it is illicit, so it's kind of hard to have very data. But what we have actually seen that there's a number of goods that, are, that go from Afghanistan to Pakistan, and then it's re-exported as Pakistani goods. Uh, you know, I'll give one example of that is in the area of, uh, uh, of uh, talc as an example. Uh, supposedly Pakistan exports 580 you know, tons or so of uh, talc, while at most they produce is about 150. So that 400 plus comes from somewhere. It's not from Pakistan. You know, uh, that, that's an example. Uh, can, we have the same issue when we talk about carpets, when we have the same issue. I'll, you know, I'll give you one other example. Uh, our pine nuts go to Pakistan. It's, the volume is about $600 million with some minimal processing. Uh, Pakistan adds another 1.2 to 1.4 billion, and it goes to China, and then China processes it more and adds another 2.4 billion dollars. So what goes uh, is sold as Chinese as uh, uh, pine nuts from China is actually from Afghanistan. Uh, so at that point, 3.6 billion dollars of uh, value added is split between in, uh, between China and Pakistan. I think in terms of the uh, and, and there are many you know uh, many other, uh, many other examples of that uh, type. In terms of the air core, you know, of course, in the airlift, there are, there are certain products that you can airlift. I mean, anything that it's, uh, of course, perishable, anything that it's high quality, uh, high uh, value items, but uh, but the weight is relatively low. When you, uh, you know, of course, it should give you a ridiculous example. You'll never airlift uh, uh, you know, marble or some other, you know, more heavier stuff because the, you know the economics would never work. So that's why I think it's kind of hard to do a reciprocity between the, uh, the air corridors as well as the goods that move back and forth from Afghanistan to Pakistan. So I want to go there, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nazira Azim Karimi, Afghan independent journalist. Khosh welcome, Mr. Qiyumi. My question is regarding copy project, how much we should be optimistic as an Afghan journalist or Afghan woman. Uh, in view of all those situation, lack of security. Number two, what's the reason of your trip this time in Washington? <laughs> I need to. Well, how much Thank time you. do you have? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, in terms of uh, the purpose of my, you know, one of my key purpose of the trip was to talk about uh, four projects that uh, uh, where we've been working with U.S. companies and you know how Afghanistan is supporting. Uh, uh, the current administration's policies in terms of buying, you know, buying American products and America First policy, and for those four projects, uh, basically, it's, that involves two uh, 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 projects in three pro uh, two projects in energy. One is a, a project that will be natural gas powered. That we will be buying a, a gas turbine from a, a Siemens gas turbine from Houston. Uh, second one is buying four. Uh, uh, GE Hydro Parse, uh, 25, uh, uh, 25 megawatt each uh, from uh, General Electric from uh, in North Carolina. The third one is uh, an agreement that we'll be signing tomorrow with MIT edX, where uh, all universities in Afghanistan will get access to over 1,600 courses that uh, MIT edX has uh, and available in over 12 languages. And our faculty could also uh, put their courses on that system, so it will be a big boost in our higher education system. And the last day is uh, a contract that we've been have had for the past year with Sasaki Associates. Sasaki is a Boston uh, world-known uh, company on the urban planning. Uh, they just finished a, a master plan framework for the city of Kabul, 
and they are going to commence working on five other cities of Afghanistan in uh, not only as a master plan but also seeing how they can look at economic opportunities and seeing on uh, in developing a plan and a framework on how we can attract investment for these cities so that's uh, one of the primary reasons uh, coming on your second uh, issue in terms of the uh, poppies uh, unfortunately we've seen the growth of uh, poppies have actually increased rather than decreased in the last year uh, you know it's, it's ironic that uh, the solar panels were, which has done so much good in Afghanistan, it has been one of the factors of making it easy to grow more poppies, especially in the Helmand area in Afghanistan. Uh, but I think the question that should really be raised uh, in, a, in a rhetorical way that if we do exactly what we have done in the past and expect a different solution, what would you really call that? And I think in terms of the poppy eradication, that has really been part of the you know, it's a policy question for us to really see has the, the approach that we have taken up to now, is that the right approach or should we really look at different solutions? Okay. We have you. Thank you. It's nice to see you, Dr. Saif and others. Sir Hulao Samani, I'm a visiting scholar with John Hopkins University and also Asian Development in Bang, Washington, DC office, but my comments do not reflect ADB's position here. Um, they, um, they, with regards to TAPI gas pipeline that you mentioned, first of all, congratulations yeah. to uh, all four countries on this axis. Uh, but uh, uh, as you know, there uh, any, any regional projects, uh, among others, uh, have two major uh, challenges. One is the costing, the second one is the geo geopolitics of that. And TAPI itself, uh, in terms of costing, you mentioned that the construction of TAPI on Afghanistan side will be funded by a Turkish company, or uh, the the or. No, I uh, talked about TAP, not TAPI. Oh, okay. So th then, uh, uh, the the cost of TAPI, who is who will fund uh, the construction of Afghanistan side and also the Pakistan side? I I, I saw the news that the Saudi uh, Arabia funded seven hundred million dollar to to TAPI, uh, which uh, is a positive thing, and also in terms of ge geopolitic issue, it's, uh, it's something of a, area of a concern. And, and ter that's costing, in terms of the geopolitics uh, aspects of it, there, in addition to TAPI, there, there has been IPI, uh, India, uh, Iran, Pakistan, uh, India pipeline, that has been going on for a long time, and the one reason that that recently you saw the news that Iran uh, uh, threatened Pakistan to sue one billion over one billion dollar because in Iran built its portion, but um, the Pakistan has not. And the one reason was the Saudi Arabia was funding Pakistan to to delay that. And now with more Saudi funding to TAPI, how would that change the dynamic of regional uh, politics of TAPI, Iran being the neighbor of Afghanistan, and uh, the pipeline is passing through that. So I've just both cost, costing and regional okay. politics of the pipeline. Okay, uh, in terms of TAPI, the way that consortium has been built, at, uh, 80, it's 85% ownership by Turkmenistan, 5% by Afghanistan, 5% by Pakistan, and 5% by India. Uh, so in terms of that whole cost issue, it's that, that same, the same ratio works. So as you can see, the brunt of that cost of the project is being paid by the uh, by Turkmenistan. Uh, secondly, I think the way that we have looked at the TAPI project is not only a gas pipeline, but we have looked at it as a corridor of different services. So the TAP, which is the high voltage line, is basically using the same alignment. The railroad is using the same alignment, as well as the roads uh, using the same alignment, and also fiber optics. So it's one of the other pieces that has not been talked much about is the fiber connectivity that will create between these four, uh, three, uh, you know, these four countries from India to uh, to uh, Turkmenistan. But beyond that, or from Turkmenistan, there is a, a pipe, uh, fiber optics connectivity under the uh, Caspian Sea to uh, to Baku, and then from there it's Jihan pipeline, which goes all the way to. Italy. So as part of it, we get this backbone of uh, uh, Iran-Italy uh, fiber optics connectivity, which could really mean a lot in terms of data movement and another alternative for the Trans-Siberian uh, 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 fiber network. 
The other aspect of it is uh, the way that we have looked at it in Afghanistan is uh, along this TAPI, we look at it as a development corridor. So for instance, in TAPI, we'll have five pumping stations along this to be able to move that gas. Uh, each one of these pumping stations would, would, house, uh, would require 200 technical people. So for the 200 people, you talk about so many other ancillary people. So each one of them really talks about development of new towns and new areas. That could really be part, uh, in how we really try to educate and uh, basically train the local uh, uh, individuals so they will be part of this project. So TAPI and all of these other uh, utilities that I mentioned would be connected to the lives and the economic viability and, and opportunity for the local areas, which, uh, you know, so that's another aspect of it that's quite important for us. In relation of this pipeline to the IPI, uh, I think uh, uh, you know, that uh, remains to be seen because it all depends upon how much uh, India would depend upon this gas, uh, the TAPI versus uh, what comes from Iran, because part of it is Iran right now does not have a lot of extra gas to sell. You know, there has not been any major exploration happening in Iran on natural gas for the last you know, almost four decades now. Uh, Iran is buying a good amount of natural gas from Turkmenistan. Uh, so, so I think that dynamics is good. Actually, the bigger issue that to ask is how the LNG uh, dynamics will impact this pipeline. I think that's a more fair question to ask for. And that part, you know, for that one, the jury is still out. I, I think for what we see, uh, there still could, uh, <coughs> given the need of uh, the major energy need of Pakistan as well as India. Uh, and when you also look at environmental consideration, uh, this pipeline is going to be quite viable and quite important because, you know, one other one aspect of the environmental that I, you know you need to you know, bring up in Afghanistan for the last 30 years, the average temperature in Afghanistan has increased 1.8 degrees Celsius. In the south, it has increased 2.2 degrees. Potential is for the next our snow melts about three weeks sooner than it used to in the 1970s, and potentially it could go another 1.8 degrees higher. 1.8 degrees in that whole region could, be, you know, could have major devastating effects. So that's why I think moving more into natural gas for some of those areas, especially when we talk about Pakistan, India, and especially Pakistan trying to use some of its, uh, this gray coal, uh, you know, they would need a good amount of this natural gas to, you know, to basically counter, uh, to counterbalance uh, some of those other plants as well. Yeah. No, I just uh, wanted to add something to that. Uh, you know, while uh, there's been uh, broad political support in India for the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, in fact, uh, one of our uh, junior ministers for uh, uh, foreign affairs was there at the groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, but to say that the uh, debate on the efficacy of pipelines in India has been foreclosed, I think uh, would be a bit of a stretch. Uh, the, the, the debate about uh, having pipelines as an economically viable project, as opposed to a peace project, uh, is something which uh, uh, continues to be debated in uh, business circles uh, extensively and that was the difficulty with the IPI pipeline also yes. as uh, Mr. Kayumi was rightly pointing out you see the gas which the Iranians were offering you know for the lack of uh, better knowledge I think it was lean gas as opposed to mean gas which was stripped gas so therefore it could only be used uh, for certain purposes and not other purposes. But the real issue with commercial, uh, uh, with, with commercial enterprises uh, who will have to depend on this pipeline for offtake is the reliability of supply. So therefore, if let's suppose on the Indian end, the government uh, of India takes it upon itself to absorb you know, whatever the offtake is, and use it for public sector units, uh, then it becomes a different story altogether. And if there's a disruption, then government would have uh, to possibly find ways of dealing with that disruption. But I do not think that private enterprise 
uh, would be willing to take the geopolitical risk that in case of an escalation of tensions, if uh, one of the corollaries is that uh, the, the flow of gas stops and you know how does that impact its businesses? And if I understand correctly, going back to the uh, mid-1990s, this was a major issue when it came to the financial closure of even the IPI pipeline. I mean, yeah, I think we'll have the final question and your final thoughts. Um, Marvin Weinbaum, the Middle East Institute. Hi. Uh, I think everyone is concerned about the security of TAPI. And it was, of, therefore, of great interest that the Taliban announced not long ago that uh, they considered this an important investment. In fact, it, they, I think they said it was, their, it was really their idea and that, uh, and that they would be supporting uh, this. So the question then becomes, what's in it for the Taliban? Uh, is there the thought here that uh, they want a piece of the action? Uh, uh, is it just a public relations gesture here? Uh, any thoughts about this? Well, I mean, I'm the least qualified to talk about the, you know, the position or the motivations of the Taliban, but uh, <laughs> I think my co you know, the, one of the things that we have tried to do on uh, infrastructure projects in the past two years is how to read this. I, as, you know, as I commented earlier, that we're looking at this whole you know, the, uh, TAPI corridor as uh, a utility corridor and also a developmental corridor. So we're uh, looking at you know, these five pumping stations as uh, potential for future uh, you know, township studies, uh, other industries or whatever that could be de developed. So the local area uh, would really see their future as part of it. You know, one of the arguments that I've always had I mean, is uh, if we uh, have a transmission line going over your property, your village, your area, and you're still living in kerosene, why would you have any interest on that transmission line being up or down or you know, doing anything? But if that, if, if that transmission line is also bringing power to your village, and also it's connecting to some industry that provides employ employment for you and some of the other people in the village, your view looks very differently. So I think you know, what we have tried to do is to look at those aspects, more importantly, as uh, um, uh, a way to look at all of these infrastructure projects. You know, I'll give you one example. Uh, two months ago, we connected uh, one of our provinces in the east, Wardak, to uh, uh, to the uh, grid power. Uh, in, the, in the past, they had only some power through diesel. And the irony was that in Wardak, that's where we had our first commercially viable hydropower plant that was built back in the 1950s, the first one, and or, or the 1940s, I believe. But for all of these years, they had diesel power, and that lines were going to Kabul. That's crazy. Now, I mean, the, the power cost for that place was, you know, was about seven times more than what people were paying in Kabul. Now, of course, they're paying the same as people in Kabul. So I think this, you know, for this idea of trying to make these projects to do something for the local area, we believe it's the far bigger guarantee of uh, security for those infrastructures. Rather, the, you know, certainly you still need uh, our forces and all of that, but to me that is the most, the more, the, a more, a more sustainable and longer term uh, security plan than just looking at whether for to the groups of Taliban or some other groups or uh, or uh, just even having the presence of the military. Any closing thoughts, please? <clears throat> no, the. Uh, Foremost closing thought is that thank you for hosting us and uh, thanks for this uh, very, uh, very enlightened or enlightening discussion. I would only uh, conclude by saying that uh, eventually uh, the vision <coughs> that uh, President Ashraf Ghani has uh, articulated about connectivity, if that really gets fully developed, even in the context of Afghanistan uh, connecting and fully integrating with its other uh, Central Asian neighbors 
and eventually uh, if on the eastern seaboard of India the connectivity uh, gets uh, fully evolved and uh, becomes seamless it would then create enough momentum and enough pressure on both sides to resolve that conundrum which can then bring about you know the connectivity of South Asia uh, to Central Asia so therefore uh, maybe uh, it would be work in progress maybe it would take time but I think we are on the right trajectory if there is enough m momentum on the seams then uh, the middle at some t at some point in time will have to give way on that note thank you very much and I invite you all to join us for uh, our annual reception which is um, which is in the next room. Thank you, and please extend a warm, a warm applause to you.